Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the uh, a very special Friday night edition of The Real Chat Daddy Show. I am your host, Art Chat Daddy Sims, and I'm here on a Friday evening uh, to entertain you guys, but we're here to talk about unity. Now more than ever, we need to come together as uh, people and talk about various issues that have been affecting us, not only in our homes, within our community, our city, our country, and our world. And so tonight I have a wonderful array of guests who will be here uh, to talk to you about a plethora of things that are going on and how they're doing things to help our community as a whole right here in the state of Illinois and here in the city of Chicago and throughout the state. So this is going to be really great tonight. Uh, tonight's show is entitled Be Counted for Unity for the Love of People, a virtual love fest. And coming up on tonight's show, uh, guess who's here? I'm super excited. Uh, the Lieutenant Governor of the state of Illinois, Juliana Stratton, will stop by tonight. Uh, she'll talk to us about COVID-19. Uh, we'll also talk about the 2020 census. And June is actually uh, Gay Pride Month. And so as of Monday, we'll be celebrating Gay Pride. And I'm super excited to talk about that as well, too. And then later on in the show, I'll welcome Mr. Donald Dew. He's a gentleman that's been heavily involved with the community, I mean, for years. And I'm honored to talk to him tonight. Uh, Donald Dew's entire mission in life has been to help other people and to bring awareness about a lot of issues that our people face. And then we also are going to meet uh, Pastor Father Larry Dowling of uh, St. Agatha's Church in North Lawndale. He'll be here tonight to talk about some wonderful things to help bring peace and healing to the people of the city of Chicago. Uh, as you guys all know, we watched a horrific murder in Minneapolis this week, and there's been a lot of unrest uh, in Minneapolis and across the country. And so uh, Father uh, Dowling will be here with us tonight to talk about just bringing peace and calm and, and unity to ourselves and fellow man. And then later on in the show, we'll meet the amazing Deborah Wesley Freeman. Uh, she is with uh, Sinai uh, Health Institute, and she is an amazing woman who is doing a lot of incredible things to help the people, uh, not only of the west side of Chicago, but throughout the entire city of Chicago. And we're honored to have her here too. So you know what the rules are to hang out. You've got to have whatever your beverage of choice. It is Friday night. I normally don't do this show on Friday night. Uh, but when you get such amazing guests like I have tonight, it is worth celebrating uh, on a Friday. And here's the deal. The governor of the state of Illinois uh, allowed us to be free uh, today. So it's a celebration of sorts. And then on Wednesday, the city of Chicago will open back up and that will be a milestone for us as well too. So when we talk to the Lieutenant Governor in just a few moments, I'm excited to talk to her about just all of the wonderful things that will be taking place and just her thoughts on all of this. Uh, this is a beautiful evening and I'm just honored to have so many of you all checking this show out. Remember, you can watch this show on Facebook, via The Real Chat Daddy Show, The Real Chat Daddy Show, or you can go to YouTube, The Real Chat Daddy Show there, and you're able to partake in this by any chance. If you miss it live, you can always see an encore performance of the show on YouTube, The Real Chat Daddy Show. Well, let me bring in our first guest this evening. Oh my gosh, she is here. Ah, oh, there she is. I am so excited. Uh, oh ladies and gentlemen, how are you? Look, I know her as Juliana Stratton, but now she is the Lieutenant Governor of the state of Illinois. And I can personally say one of the most humble people, dedicated, committed, uh, love for the love of mankind is who she's been ever since I've known her. And now I have the honor and pleasure of interviewing her tonight. Good evening, Lieutenant Governor. How are you, Madam Lieutenant Governor? I am doing great, Chad Daddy. And by the way, I wore a green dress for the green room. Uh, see, I love you. See, that's what I'm talking about, for the green room. You see what I'm saying? And I wore flowers for you. See, if, if we were in a real studio, I would yeah. present you with a bouquet of flowers. You see what I'm and saying? So here I am. I'm your bouquet of flowers. How are you? How's everything? Oh, everything is well. You know, I wake up every day and say, is the family well? Am I okay? Is everyone healthy? And when that answer is yes, it is a good day. I mean, needless mm -hmm. to say, it's been very busy. 
Uh, I'm really, really proud of all Illinoisans who helped us to get to this point uh, where we are now have moved to phase three of the Restore Illinois plan. Uh, but I also know that uh, there's been a lot of uh, loss, a lot of uh, sickness, and not to mention lots of other things going on in our community. So it's a heavy day today. How are you yeah. doing and how are you holding up through through this these uncertain times we've been in? Well, believe it or not, Lieutenant Governor, we're in day number 75 of our shelter in place. And so it's, I it's, it's, yeah, I know it's been very interesting to say the least. I feel great. I enjoy doing this show each and every evening because people want to be informed. They want to be entertained. They want to meet people on a level where they can understand what is being said. And so, no, everything has been absolutely wonderful. Uh, I just was super excited to be able to interview you. And so we created a special Friday night show to make this happen. And for a lot of my audience that does not know who you are and a little bit about your background, you're originally from the South side of Chicago. Originally and still from the South side of Chicago. Of course, now I also have a residence in Springfield, Illinois. Um, that I, you know, when we're in session, I'm there and I was there last week while the legislature was in session. Uh, but yes, I'm from the South side of Chicago and a graduate of Kenwood Academy for high Ooh. school and then went on to the University of Illinois for undergrad where I studied broadcast journalism, thought I might be a news reporter or anchor. And then oh, I, I could see that. I could easily see that. I, right. Look, I'm a little jealous. Like we make a great team. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> That's right. And then I went to uh, DePaul University College of Law. Uh, and, and really throughout my legal career, I had my own business where I was doing alternative dispute resolution as a mediator and an arbitrator. But I also um, just really have always been interested in issues related to justice and had done that both on my sort of on my own time serving the community. I've been in public service my whole life and I'm just so very proud to serve as the 48th Lieutenant Governor of the state of Illinois. I have four daughters. I'm married to Brian and uh, yeah, so and I'm a house head. I guess I should add that as well. That's what I'm talking about. Yeah, look, the only thing we're missing is a little music tonight. That's the only thing. We'll yes, I, I'm going to tell you a little secret that you didn't know and quite a few people, but I actually was the youth governor of the state of Illinois in 1984. What? The YMCA program had a youth in government program, and I actually was elected the first African-American youth governor in the state of Illinois in 1984, and we had a mock youth government weekend, and so I ran the state for the weekend, but I was the youth I, I governor of the state of Illinois. I know you it did is. a great job, too. I love well, that. Back. I, I've never heard of the youth governor program, and clearly I'm assuming they don't have it anymore. No, and that's something that we really should bring back so that our young people are able to learn about the governmental process and how Let's it all work works. On Let's work on oh, that together. I would love to have a young person kind of come on and, and see what ideas they might have for our state. Our young people are amazing. Beautiful. I love it. Well, I want to talk a little bit more about COVID-19 and the fact that this was something that just kind of hit us. It has changed the way we live. Our new normal now is doing interviews like this, uh, seeing our doctors like this. Um, Lieutenant Governor, what do you think will be next for us as we move forward through this time that we've been through? Yeah, well, first and foremost, uh, I just want to say to those that are watching that I uh, certainly hope you, you are healthy and well. I know many of you have been personally touched by COVID-19. Um, I think it's hard, certainly for those of us in the Black community, to not know somebody who has either uh, contracted the virus or has died from the virus, and that's certainly the case for me, so I want to begin by extending my condolences and um, just letting you know that you continue to be in my thoughts and sending well wishes to all of the viewers. Um, so, you know, we're moving to phase three, and I think the main thing that I want to say to everyone now that we've moved to phase three is that phase three does not mean that COVID-19 is gone. 
And I want to repeat that COVID-19 is not gone. And because I think that with the weather getting warm and everybody kind of saying, oh, okay, I'm going to see restaurants starting to open and salons and barbershops, that does not mean that COVID-19 is no longer a risk. And we know mm -hmm. that our communities of color are even more vulnerable. So it's important to recognize that, um, you know, we still have to be vigilant with what we have to do. We still have to wear masks. I want everybody to wear masks in public uh, spaces, continue to physically distance and to wash our hands and do everything that we know. And by the way, it still is best to stay at home. And I know that there's some things that you can now venture out and do, but the best thing is to continue to stay at home because there is no vaccine. There is no uh, reliable treatment. What we can look for next, uh, Chat Daddy, is we can think about um, the fact that we have to continue to increase testing and con uh, contact tracing, which is really focused on making sure that if somebody tests positive, that we can know who have you been in contact with, who have you been around, who, mm -hmm. you know, kind of retracing your steps so that we can reach out to those individuals and make sure that they know, hey, you've been in contact with someone, you should get tested. That's one of the main ways that we can stop the spread. But we're mm -hmm. going to see our, you know, we certainly uh, know that our small businesses are going to start opening back up. We, we want to support our small businesses. We want to make sure those who have been through such difficult times economically during these past uh, two months will have the opportunity to uh, kind of rebuild their business and, and, and tend to people. But at the same time, you know, I always say we still have to make sure that we, uh, you know, don't just run out there and rush to everything because really it's still a risk and we, we need you to be safe. You know, you're absolutely right, Lieutenant Governor. You know, I've been saying to my audience night after night that this is a perfect time to uh, pivot. This is a perfect time to learn a new hobby, a new skill. Uh, just e even if you just study COVID-19 and all of the things, as you said, trackers and uh, temperature takers and things like this, I think this will really help a lot of the people of our state to find new ways of doing things and, and new forms of employment and things like that. So I'm just so honored to know that you are proactive in us moving forward with this. And I want to commend both you and the governor for doing just an extraordinary job during this time, because I can only imagine how stressful this can be yeah it's been a lot and it's been heavy but i can say i'm so proud of governor pritzker who every single day has come before the people of illinois to say honestly and accurately uh and with real transparency and clarity here's um you know here's what we're dealing with these are the decisions that we're making of course me and all of our teams have been working behind the scenes and just making sure that we could support you know, the governor's effort and then what about Dr. Zike, right? You know, Dr. Oh. Zike leading our Illinois Department of Public oh. Health. Love her. She Love so her. Compassion. So it has been a team effort, but the state of Illinois, as the governor said in his briefing today, all of you for, who are Illinoisans, and I know that you go global with your, your program, but for those of you who are Illinoisans, you should know that you should feel very proud uh, that uh, state government workers all throughout the state have worked so hard uh, to get us to this point, not to mention, of course, all of our essential workers, those on the front lines and so many. So it's it's been a time. And when you talk about pivot, I just want to say, you know, one of uh, the the 23 year old is still in this house. And uh, she, when you talk about new, she has made focaccia bread. She has done tie dye. So we're about to make candles. So there's oh, a lot of things it. we're learning. But people can sign up. You can go to our IDPH website if you're interested in learning about being a contact tracer. It's going to be important for communities of color that we have people that are credible messengers and can be trusted within the community when somebody calls and says, hey, I want to talk to you about the fact that you might have been exposed to COVID-19. Sign a brother up. I'm, I'm down for it. I am. I'm interested in doing that. And you're absolutely right. I'm much like the 23-year-old. Uh, I'm taking sign language online. And I'm taking Mandarin Chinese. So so you're right. This has been a perfect time for all of that. Really, it has. Well, Gov uh, Lieutenant Governor, I I'm thinking Governor, but Lieutenant Governor, uh, I want to continue on with you by saying, let's talk about the 2020 census 
and how important it is for people to complete their census. I, I've been all about, you know, being on people about completing it, getting it done. And so, first of all, for those that may not understand what is the census and how it works, because a lot of people, I don't want y'all in my business and you don't need to know who in my house. What is the census and how does it work for us? Yeah, well, first of all, thank you for your efforts to make sure people are talking about the census and thank you for this special program tonight. Um, so the census to me is really a matter of equity. Uh, it is a matter of representation. It is a matter of resources. It's basically saying that, you know what? My voice matters. I want to be counted because when you're divvying up the resources that come from the federal government, uh, I want to make sure that we get you know, I, I, like I'd like to say, I get mine. Like I make sure mm -hmm. that we get ours. We make mm -hmm. sure that our community gets the maximum amount of resources that are available. Um, there's a census every 10 years to do a complete count of the number of people that are represented all throughout the United States. And the bottom line is, is that um, when we have an undercount and we are considered in communities of color, we are hard to count communities. And there's lots of other hard to count communities. Uh, when I think about um, people who are housing insecure, hard to count community, children under the age of five, hard to count mm -hmm. community, LGBTQIA plus community, hard to count community, and people in rural communities, hard to count communities. And so what happens is, is that when we think about resources coming to communities, if we get an undercount of just 1%, we will lose $195 million to the state of Illinois. Wow. Of an undercount is $195 million that are left on the table that are not brought to our communities. I don't know about you, but in the age of COVID-19, I mean, we knew this before, but in the age of COVID-19, I have not heard anyone say, oh, we have enough resources. We don't need anything else. So we need our resources. We need to get ours. And the way that we can do that is to be counted. And let me just say, when I got my envelope in the mail, I got online, 2020census.gov. It took me 10 minutes, really less than 10 minutes to complete Indeed. my census. So the idea of um, it's safe, it's confidential. They need the racial data so that they can say, okay, we have this population of the black community, the Latinx community, the Asian community, whatever community is being represented. They need to know because that way when resources are being distributed, um, we can say, give us everything that we are due because we are here. I want you to see us and the way you are seen is by making sure you complete the census. Mm -hmm. Very important. I agree with you 100%. It does not take long, you guys. Uh, you know, let's do this because really, if you live in an underserved community, your community will still stay underserved if they don't know what resources and how many people need to have the improvement of the resources. So, yes, I agree with you 100%. I'm on your team on that one as well. I want to talk to you about All In Illinois Awareness Campaign. Uh, what is that all about? And you got some heavy hitters joining you on this campaign as well, too. Well, the All In Illinois campaign was really launched by Governor Pritzker, who uh, about a month ago um, really wanted to let Illinoisans all across our state. We, we represent close to 13 million residents of the state of Illinois. Uh, and really to say that as we tackle this COVID-19 pandemic, uh, it's not going to be just healthcare professionals. It's not just going to be government leaders at every level. It is going to require all of us to be all in Illinois. And so uh, we have to do our part. And you know, you've seen the things that we have to do. We had to stay at home. We had to um, make sure that we uh, washed our hands and stayed physically distant and that we now wear masks out in public. And so um, what when I saw the disparities that were highlighted through the Illinois Department of Public Health data concerning black and brown communities, I really wanted to expand upon that all in Illinois uh, campaign and really focus on the communities that are being hardest hit by this pandemic. Mm -hmm. And so I, what, I, what I thought is that it was important that we brought people from our community, people who have roots in our community, to speak directly to black and brown communities all across the state. People like Reverend Otis Moss from Trinity United Church of Christ. People like the spoken word poet, um, 
J. Ivy, who is an NAACP award, image award winner and from HBO Deaf Comedy Jam, or um, people like Pastor Chris Harris from Bright Star Church mm -hmm. and Tiffany Mathis from the Girls Boys and Girls Club of Central Illinois. And really to say in our first phase of this campaign, and we'll be doing some more and having other credible, what I call credible, credible messengers, to give the message that, look, yes, we're opening up, but black communities and brown communities have been more likely to be exposed because we're often on the front lines as essential workers. We're more likely to uh, have uh, test positive. We're more likely to uh, die from COVID-19, at least disproportionately, I should say, uh, would be the, the better term. More dis We're disproportionately likely to die. And so um, because of that, it's important that I felt that it was really important that we speak directly to our communities and say, even though we're opening back up, uh, you know, remember, we're still at risk. We're at greater risk. We have more underlying uh, chronic health conditions like diabetes and um, high blood pressure, asthma, heart disease. And these are things that make us more vulnerable. And mm -hmm. so uh, it just is really important to me that, um, you know, as a black woman, as the first black lieutenant governor of our state, and as we go through these unprecedented times, uh, it was important for me to make sure that we took this extra effort. The, the governor, governor and I partnered together to do this. And uh, I'm just really proud of the outcome. Well, we are very proud of the outcome and we're very proud of you. Before I have to let you go, uh, you know, June is Pride Month and every year we, you know, go to the parade, have a great time, do everything. But because of COVID-19, a lot of the celebrations throughout the state, mo all of the celebrations have been canceled or postponed. And so what message of uh, hope and acceptance do you want to say as far as Pride and let's wish Pride a happy celebration despite the situation we're in? Yes. Yeah, so, no, I absolutely. First of all, I know all of us, uh, there's so many different celebrations that we are all missing uh, due to this pandemic. And it's important that we continue to, uh, you know, recognize that we'll get back to them one day. It just is not now. So to all of my uh, brothers and, and sisters and friends and those from the LGBTQ uh, I, a community, um, for those who uh, would be looking to celebrate being who you are and being authentic in who you are, being truthful in who you are and having pride in who you are. I just want to say uh, we are celebrating this um, this uh, month of June, uh, even with, though we can't gather together, just know that we are celebrating um, all month long to make sure that we not only celebrate pride, but to keep fighting for equity and justice, keep fighting for opportunities for work and freedom from violence, keep fighting to make sure that black trans women uh, can live and breathe and be who they are without fear of being attacked or killed. And we are going to keep celebrating um, and, and working and fighting alongside one another to make sure that things like housing and health care and the other things that are so needed in this community are available. So it's a celebration, virtually perhaps, but it's also a fight. And we're going to keep doing that. And I'm just so grateful for all the leadership and certainly thankful for you, Chat Daddy, for all the work that you do to keep continue to promote equity and opportunity and justice for all. Thank you so very much. We've gotten so much feedback tonight. And I didn't want to run the ticker across the across your face when we were talking, but everybody just wants to thank you. Uh, they thought this was just the most beautiful interview ever. We'll also put the census information up there so people can take it. Uh, before I let you go, uh, what's a typical downtime for you? I, I know you love music. Do I mean, I, and you're busy. You're everywhere. And so what's a typical downtime? Yeah, it's been extremely busy and it's been stressful. And so I hope that all of you are taking some time to find things that bring you joy. I've had to be like radical about self-care because um, I start my day and it's talking about COVID all day and I'm kind of not moving. I'm sitting. Usually I'm traveling the state. And I just want to say for all of you, by the way, who have been looking for me, thank you for your sending your love and your care and concern. I have been well. 
I've been working behind the scenes and working remotely and following the governor's stay at home order. Um, but what I will say is for downtime, um, for me, I get a good walk or run in every single day. I make sure I get my 10,000 steps on my Fitbit every single day, and then I do some other workout. But Brian and I enjoy um, just kind of sitting out in the yard, on the backyard, uh, in the on the balcony, uh, just talking and debriefing and like just putting this the work aside for a moment. So once it gets to like late evening, I got to turn off the phone because it can become too much for us to be engulfed with that. And of course, I just want to say before I end, and I know you have some other guests, but I just want to say that we are all hurting today. You know, with the incidents that have happened and, and that we are seeing with uh, Brother George Floyd in Minnesota and his uh, murder um, and, um, you know, just the emotions are so high. I know that our community is ex experiencing so much trauma and so much stress at many different levels. It's just layered. And mm -hmm. so I just want to say, take care of yourself. Um, right. Self-care is so important. Find a way to step away, breathe. You know, and I, like I said to somebody today, I want to keep trying to breathe because he couldn't. So I just wanted to say rest in power to George Floyd. Black lives do matter and we keep fighting for justice and we'll do that together. All right. Well, we just love you so much, Lieutenant Governor. I just thank you for taking time out of your very busy schedule. This was truly an honor for me this evening just to sit down and talk to you on this level. I already knew you were charming, personable, a good person, but just to see you in the position that you're in and to know you're still that wonderful person that I met many years ago, I'm just honored in many ways to have you here tonight and God bless you and your family. Thank you, Chad, Daddy. God bless you. And thank you. Um, you know, anytime you call me to try to come on the show, I'm going to try to figure it out. Thanks so much for having me tonight and have a great rest of the show. Thank you so much. Ladies and gentlemen, the Lieutenant Governor of the state of Illinois, the amazing Juliana Stratton. Give it up for her. Thank you so much. Good night. And we'll be in touch with you soon. All right. Thank you. Thank you. All right. We just love her. We do. Oh, my God. Wasn't that amazing, you guys? See, Friday night, it's worth it. I am Art Chat Daddy Sims, uh, the host of The Real Chat Daddy Show. This is a special Friday night edition of The Real Chat Daddy Show. Uh, tonight, we're here to talk about love, happiness, and unity. Uh, we want you guys to be counted for the 2020 census. If you've not done so yet, we ask that you please do what's needed to be done to fill out your census. Remember, if you are not counted, you will not be in the mix. You will not be in the loop. And now more than ever, due to COVID-19, we all must be counted. We all must be uh, accounted for as well, too. Not just accounted, but accounted for our actions and what we do. Well, I think my co-host is here tonight. Uh, this man, uh, wait, I've never seen this man in a baseball cap, but this is called COVID-19. So we've had a lot of guests in a baseball cap. Ladies and gentlemen, here he is. Uh, the one and only Mr. Donald Dew. Uh, good evening, brother. How are you? Are you there? Good evening, Chad Daddy. I'm doing wonderful. How about you? I'm glad to have you here tonight, Donald. What an honor and a pleasure to have you as my co-host this evening. Uh, when I was told that they were able to get you, I said, listen, that's my buddy. And he's been he's been helping the community. Donald, you obviously started helping the community, what, in preschool? <laughs> Feels like it around these days, Chad. Yeah, it was preschool, wasn't it? Sure. Well, actually, back in 1978. <laughs> well, Donald, tell everybody who you are. Well, let me say this: Donald J. Do is the president and CEO of Habilitative Systems Inc. Uh, a vital Chicago-based health and human service organization that has done some amazing work here in the city of Chicago, has helped many people. And as I said before, he's been in this business since preschool. And, and, and so, Donald, tell everybody a little bit about all the amazing things that you've been doing. And just an honor to have you here with us this evening. Well, again, thank you so much, Chad Daddy, for the opportunity to be on your show tonight, Real Chat. Daddy show. That's right. Thank you, sir. The last time we were together, uh, you may recall, it was on a women's empowerment forum. Um, That's right. That's uh, right. Yes. This is uh, many, many years ago. And that was yeah. a very empowering show. Uh, uh -huh. but, you know, uh, I tell you, we've been uh, doing a lot. Um, uh, you know, I've actually um, been at HSI now for 36 years. And 
I've had the privilege and uh, honor of serving as the CEO now for 30 years. And, um, you know, Habilitative Systems, Inc. Uh, actually grew out of Craig Christian United Methodist Church. And uh, as part of that uh, community ministry, you know, they reached out to uh, provide services to older wards of the state, uh, young um, black boys, and also um, reached out and did a rotary program for persons who were recovering from alcoholism and substance abuse, and also operated a structured workshop for people with disabilities. So from those three programs back in 1978, uh, actually till now in 2020, we are doing over 45 programs, 15 different locations on the south and west sides of Chicago. We constructed $20 million of new construction uh, for senior citizens and people with disabilities, uh, co-founded the West Side Community Triage and Wellness Center with Bobby Wright uh, Comprehensive Behavioral Health Center. I mean, it's been one thing after another, opportunity after another. The most recent and most beautiful experience has been to lead the Counting on Chicago Coalition 2020, uh, a 30-member group of uh, folks who have been serving the west and south sides of Chicago for 40, 50, 60 plus years, folks wow. who are in the trenches making it happen. So we've been busy, never a dull moment yet. Yes, sir, you have. You've been really doing it. Let me ask you this. What impact has COVID-19 placed on your industry? We've got to think about the fact that this is a global pandemic that pretty much shut the world down yeah. and you are handling people who are at risk. And, and so you are handling people that could easily be led astray if they don't continue to have the guidance and nurturing and support. Absolutely. So what has COVID, what has the effect of COVID been like? It's, it's been a real challenge. Um, and let me just say that uh, we want to salute all of our healthcare uh, colleagues who have been on the front lines and providing uh, much needed medical care. And the thing that we really got to also emphasize is that there's so many other essential workers out here. You know, the folks who are cleaning up those hospitals, you know, the folks who are delivering well, and, you know, the folks who are keeping our roads, you know, clear, and on and on and on. And in our particular industry, you know, we're serving people with developmental disabilities, you know, persons who are very, at, at very high risk. Uh, unfortunately, we've had one of our, our staff to pass away as a result of COVID, who have been with us over 20 years. Um, right. so for a lot of the folks in our industry, chat, you know, we're, working with the homeless, people with disabilities, people with challenges with mental illness, um, you, you name it, every major challenge in life we're dealing with, but the reality of the situation is that, you know, we're having to confront the, the reality of COVID, you know, and trying to provide service. So we are trying to protect and serve at the same time. And mm -hmm. yeah, you know, many of our staff, you know, have been diagnosed in, in many, many cases. And we, you know, every time we get together now for uh, a meeting with our colleagues to talk about uh, different initiatives, one of the first things that we have to do is do a temperature check with folks. You know, how are we doing? You know, just because we're in the industry doesn't make it any easier to deal with. You know, we're still mm -hmm. qualified, you know, we're losing people and people are sick and people are having to take off time from work. You know, we have to go through all of the major guidance um, criteria and mandates associated with maintaining sanitation and safe facilities. You know, so, I mean, all of these challenges are here on many significant levels. And I just want to salute all of my colleagues because we yes. have not stopped. We have continued to serve despite the challenges of COVID-19. That's right. Very good. And, and with the state and city opening back up, I'm sure there's a lot of policies and procedures that you guys, again, as you said, would have to put in place yes. and rethink, you know, rethink the way things have been done in the past. So interesting. Absolutely. I mean, you know, one of the main challenges, something as simple as getting protective equipment. I mean, you know, it was very difficult for us, you know, to get that equipment. And at the same time, when we were able to get it, it was very, very costly. So now mm -hmm. we're trying to get more and more donations, thank God, um, that you know more donations are coming in and we're able to purchase more. But in the beginning, it was very, very challenging. Oh, I can only imagine. And then I'm thinking about the social distancing, uh, just you know, keeping people at, just at bay, just food service. Yeah. There's so much to think about all of this. You know, it really yeah. is. Absolutely. So I want to talk about your... Uh, situation with the Chicago Coalition for the Census and just how important that is. We just had a wonderful conversation with the Lieutenant Governor of the state of Illinois, Juliana Stratton, yes. and she was emphasizing the importance of the census. Let's talk about this and, and what a lot of people don't understand. We're two brothers talking about this. You know yes. what I'm saying? Trying to let people know it is important. And by the way, a lot of your Q brothers said, what's up, Donald? <laughs> they, they chiming in on here. They are. But Let's talk about the importance of the census. Well, you know, first of all, uh, I have to thank our governor, uh, our lieutenant governor, for investing $29 million in the state of Illinois 
to ensure that we had a fair and accurate count. You know, when the Lieutenant Governor said that we stood to lose $195 billion, you know, potentially. A lot of money. That's a lot of money to be lost. A lot of services that would be lost, a lot of resources that would be lost, you know, if we don't get an accurate count. You know, so again, enough cannot be said about all of our colleagues that have come together from the south and west side of Chicago. This is about unity. I mean, for the south and west sides to come together to make sure that folks are counted, to make sure that, you know, folks are getting the needed services. And let me talk a little bit about that. Because when our group got together and, you know, we looked at it and we said, well, wow, this is being led by the Illinois Department of Human Services. So mm -hmm. being led by the Illinois Department of Human Services, it should be a no-brainer. We've got to focus in on basic human needs, social determinants of health. So we're not just going to call folks and knock on doors and do events that talk about the importance of being counted. First and foremost, we're going to let, make people know for sure that they care, that they count. And the way that we do that is to make sure that they're getting the basic human needs met. Those vital right. services have to be met. So that's the first point. The second point, of course, with the advent of COVID-19, We've also been asking that question. Do you have, um, you know, protective safe, um, um, protective um, facial mask? You know, do you have gloves? You know, do you have sanitation equipment? You know, we're trying to make sure that the general welfare of folks is being taken care of first and foremost. And then from that particular position, after getting that dual, triple messaging out there, we're able to say, look, we do count, we do care. Let's make sure that you complete this census. And now we're out there with various elected officials who are giving out um, safety masks, we're also giving out census material at the same time. So we're at, you know, you name it, we're at a West Side Unity Parade. And, you know, we've been at every major venue, NBA All-Stars. We're out there at college high school, you know, promoting the census. Every opportunity we have to come together and to really lift up the community and talk about the importance of being counted, we're doing just that. Mm, I love it. I really, really do. Uh, in, in a day and age now of what we're, what we witnessed this week of the murder of another black man at the hands of the police. Um, this is now a world news story that everyone is talking about. My heart has been just hurt watching another black man perish. I'm sure your heart, as well as everybody who's watching this show. And, you know, Donald, with you being in this business as long as you have and being of servitude to people, what does that say to you to watch another black man's life be snuffed out like that? You know, first of all, Chad, Daddy, um, my, my prayers and, and my energy, my, my heartfelt condolences go to uh, the Floyd family and, and, the, and the pain and the trauma that they're going through right now. And everyone else that is reliving trauma who have been a victim of some type of trauma. Because it's the types of incidents like these that reawaken, if you will, traumatic episodes. Uh, and, you know, the other part about it, and, and this is a very painful part of it, is that, you know, it begins to reinforce, if you will, within the psyche of some, I really don't know. That they don't really care about me. I, I'm less than human, and I can be treated less than a dog. In fact, a dog, in some cases, will be treated better than me. You know, mm -hmm. that's mm -hmm. the kind of thing that is heart-wrenching to see that in 2020, you know, we still can't see it. Just think about that for a minute, Chad. In 2020, many of us still can't see. In reality, right. that it's all about humanity. It's all about living up life, loving life. I mean, another thing tonight is about love. I mean, if we don't embrace love and have in a moment an appreciation for that agape or divine love, then we lose it. We miss the point. Right. So mm -hmm. we're at a point right now where we've got to let everybody know that kind of situation in Minnesota with Brother Floyd. And I call him affectionately Brother Floyd because he is my brother. That's yeah. right. That's right. You know, we're going back to the 60s and 70s with some of this stuff, Chad. We got to. Because That's right. The kinship related to what this experience is all about. And we got to remember that in one decade, in one decade, everybody was fighting for civil rights. Many folks who were fighting for civil rights were taken out and assassinated. And that mm -hmm. made folks a lot more apathetic. Mm -hmm. thing, you know, so when we see this kind of incident, Chad, I, I, was, I did a flashback. I did a flashback to when I was a little boy growing up on the west side, and my friends and I were playing in the sandlot, and all of a sudden we heard several police cars, you know, pull up, scoop in the brakes, got out the cars, guns drawn, made us get down on the ground, face first, put guns to our heads, and said, niggas, if y'all move, we'll blow your bones out. 
Now, Chad, you know as well as I do, on the west side of Chicago, that story could have been real differently. That's right. That's right. That's right. And, and you know, Donald, it's amazing that you even brought that up. I put a post out on social media yesterday looking for black men that want to share stories like this. And next Wednesday night, I'm doing a two hour town hall uh, conversation on the state of black men and how we have continuously been traumatized by authority figures, yes. whether it's whether it's employment, whether it's uh, the police, uh, whether it's authorities, whoever the case may be, every black man has a story of being so traumatized by someone who they thought, again, was officer friendly or someone who they thought was, was a, a, a wonderful leader or whatever the case may be. And I think the reason why there's so much disconnect with our black men is that we've been hurt so much that we're afraid to admit that we need the help. And once we get it, we're afraid nobody's going to help us. And oh, I think we've got to do it. We've got to do it, Chad. And, and let me just say this also. Um, I have been fortunate to witness um, some, of, some of the brothers that actually went to college with who have become, you know, Chicago policemen. And, you know, the last time I was stopped by a policeman, it was one of my fraternity brothers. <laughs> you know? and, and I just thought to myself, I said, this is very different. I remember when the Afro-American Performance League was fighting for basic rights within the Chicago Police Department. And right. so you now so many of our African-American policemen out there, you know, clearly with a lot more sensitivity. I mean, this past weekend, last weekend, I was out with Deputy Chief Cato, Commander Spencer, leading the West Side Unity Parade. And the, and the police were leading the charge and people were clapping and, and shouting in the streets, thank you. It was a very different view of the police right. department here in Chicago than what we're seeing in Minnesota right now. So, mm -hmm. so there are chances, there's opportunities in the face of great threats for something beautiful, something great, something loving, something uplifting to occur. And we gotta keep our people inspired no matter what. Yes, you're absolutely right. Well, with that being said, let me uh, do a little chit chat here so I can let everybody know what we're doing. Uh, you're looking at a very special Friday night edition of The Real Chat Daddy Show. You guys know I'm normally on Monday through Thursday nights from 7 to 8.30 p.m. But tonight we're here because we want you to be counted for unity. Uh, this is all about for the love of people. Uh, this is a virtual love fest tonight. Already we've had the honor and pleasure of the Lieutenant Governor of the State of Illinois, Juliana Stratton, hanging out with us. Uh, my good buddy, Mr. Donald J. Du, is uh, my co-host tonight. Uh, he is a gentleman who I've been teasing him earlier, saying since preschool, see Donald, he, the police, the police was after you when you was in the sandbox. And I said, since preschool, you have been helping other people. He has, he has made this a lifelong mission of being dedicated to serving uh, other people. And we're just honored to have him here tonight. We have other guests that will be joining us in just a little bit. But Donald and I are just talking about things that have been going on. This story about the murder of George uh, Floyd in Minneapolis, Minnesota is just way too much. I, I am disgusted. Uh, the one thing that I will say, Donald, is that, believe it or not, I've had friends of other races who have reached out to me in the last 24 hours just to check on me, to see how I am. Anybody who know that I you know, have been through something or whatever the case may be, they've all said, brother, how you doing? And that's the one thing I appreciate because in times like this, you really find out who's in your corner and who's not in your corner. Wouldn't you agree? Without a question, you know, I think about the fact that um, when we were fighting and have continued to fight for liberation in this country for 400 years, there's always been folks of other races that have really been right next to us, side by side, fighting for liberation. We even see a lot of white folks over the, throughout the country, you know, protesting side by side with black folks saying, hey, look, it's not tolerable. It's not something that is acceptable for us to allow this kind of thing to occur in the United States of America. You know, I mean, clearly this is an opportunity for us to do the right thing. You know, when I think about not only the founding of the NAACP, another one of our major partners, uh, you know, on the west side of Chicago, you know, they've been fighting for the upliftment and advancement of, of black folks for over 100 years. And we know that the founders of the NAACP was also a multicultural group, a multicultural mm -hmm. group. 
So there's mm-hmm. always been folks who have understood that injustice anywhere is unacceptable to any race of folks. Yes, absolutely. I couldn't agree with you more. So, Donald, before we go on to our next guest uh, tonight, I kind of want to find out. So what you've been doing these 75 days, we kind of been stuck in the crib. Have you been working remotely? Uh, you've grown a great beard. Uh, so what else have you been doing during this uh, stay in place, shelter in? One of my colleagues said I was uh, working on my Moses. <laughs> yes, yes, you are. Yes, you are. Either that or Black Santa Claus this year. That's, one, that's one, of the two. one of the two. But, you know, um, yeah, my partner and I, we have been uh, making sure that we continue to take care of each other, uh, take care of our family, um, you know, continue to take care of our community. Um, within the organizational structure, you know, we have uh, made it a point uh, to continue to look at ways and means that, you know, we could be more introspective during this time. And you referenced that a little bit earlier in the show, Chat Daddy. Uh, this is a time to plan. Uh, strategic planning is key. Uh, looking at your strengths, your weaknesses, your opportunities, and your threats. You know, looking at ways that you can have impact and do some significant environmental scanning. When I talk mm-hmm. about environmental scanning, sir, I'm talking about not just external scanning, I'm talking about income scanning. What are the kinds of things that you've been feeding your mind on that may lead you to a place of uh, depression, if you will, um, feelings of inadequacy? Uh, you mm-hmm. know, how are we going to talk about a self love tonight? You know, you cannot engage in self-love and upliftment if you are engaged in negative self-talk. So, you know, this period, you know, is, is, a, is, a, is an opportunity to go through um, mental cleansing, if you will, uh, spiritual right. uplift, if you will. Uh, right. I'm the models of men who felt your perseverance and uplift. You know, we're talking about looking at those things that inspire us to do as opposed to those things that really reduce us to depression, anxiety, and lack of care and consideration. Well, now, are we getting ready to open up the good church of Donald J. Do? Are we, are we, look, are we getting ready to have a online church? Are we, you know what I'm saying? Because I think that's what people are saying, brother, you know, and, and that's why we created tonight's show. You know what I'm saying? You are absolutely right. I think now more than ever, yes. we've got to love ourselves yes. and then turn around and love our brother and sister. I think, you know, Last night on this show, we had a conversation. Dr. Tony M. Bond was here with me, a theologian. And the question last night was, where is God in all of this? You know, is God upset and angry right now? Or is this under God's control of everything that is going on? And see, ever since this pandemic has happened, Donald, I have been saying those that are last will now be first Mm -hmm. and those that were first will now be last and i do think that that's where we are in our society today well you know i couldn't agree more with you chad buddy and and let me just say that uh my take on this is that god's hand is totally in the plan and yes i look at again wherever there's a threat there's also an opportunity now the greatest opportunity that we have seen is that we've had 30 different organizations to come together on the south and west sides of Chicago to serve our people's greatest needs. Mm-hmm. Now, in my recollection, in the time that I've been providing you know, health and human services, I've never seen this many organizations come together to provide this level and quality of service. And the thing mm-hmm. that's most inspiring is that we're saying it's not going to end with the census. Now, if that's not God's hand and plan, I don't know what is. Yes. You're absolutely right. Well, let's bring our next guest in. He's a gentleman that I've had the pleasure of meeting several times. Uh, My good friend, Winona Redmond, this is her home church, and she always takes me over to St. Agatha. I've emceed a few things over there. Uh, St. Agatha is doing a lot of wonderful work in the North Lawndale community. And, uh, you know, the one thing I'm going to say about Father Larry Dowling, Dowling is that he's a soul brother. He, he, he is through the soul, uh, brother. He 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 a lot of wonderful work in the North. Where North he North is. North Can you hear us, uh, Father? You know, the one thing I'm going to say about Father Larry Downing. Oh, he's on delay, but he'll hear us in just a second. He, 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 he is through the soul, brother. He is through the soul, brother. Thanks, Chad. How are you, Father? How are you doing this evening? I'm doing very well. I'm not uh, here. We're, uh, we're continuing to work hard at uh, reaching out in the community, making a difference. And uh, thank you, uh, we got him on loop too. You might need to turn the volume down a little bit, Father. Quiet out. Oh, did we lose him? 
So we're doing well. We're doing well. We're doing well. We're doing well. Turn the volume down a little bit, Father. Okay, sorry about that. That's okay. Let's see. Can we? So we're doing well. We're doing well. We're doing well. Turn the volume down a little bit, Father. Perfect. Can you hear me now? I can hear you. All right. Well, Father, tell us about all of the wonderful things that you have going on. And I want to talk about the food circles that you do. So we're, so we're doing a lot in the community over the last... Uh, can you hear me now? I can. I Thank can you. you. All right. Well, Father, tell us about all of the wonderful things that you have going on. And I want to talk about the food circles that you do. Okay. We're, so we're, we're continuing to do a lot of outreach in the community. Uh, with uh, Thank you. All right, well, Father, tell us about all of the wonderful things. Um, we're serving probably close to 100 families a week. Um, with, uh, and uh, through uh, with food baskets, uh, we're helping out a lot with uh, utility bills. Uh, sometimes we're able to help with rent. And we're just trying to stay in contact with people. We've got our team of uh, restorative justice workers out working, uh, connecting with families, making sure that uh, their needs are being taken care of. And we're continuing to do uh, all that we can to just reach out and make a difference in the community. Uh, oh, boy. Something is continuously looping. Father, try Donald, do you want to say something while we're trying to get Father's feet right. better? Yeah, actually, I think it, I think it just corrected itself. Father, are you okay now? Did it correct? Unfortunately, I cannot hear you now. Well, you oh, but we can hear you. Sorry. Continue to keep talking. Continue to keep. We hear you, Father, perfectly. We'll, we'll have you come back in in just a second. Okay, Donald, let's get Father back in. We'll give him some time to talk some more. Uh, he's been doing a lot of great things over there at St. Agatha, and, and you've witnessed a lot of the great things that he's done, correct? Absolutely. And, um, you know, he's got a great media program over there for the youth, and um, they have been reaching out quite a bit in the North Lawndale area. And, you know, uh, you may recall uh, Father Mike Ivers uh, was there many, many years ago doing great work as well. And, you know, one of the things that, you know, we, you know, can't say enough about in terms of St. Agatha is that they are deeply rooted in the West Side community. As you know, uh, many um, uh, Catholic churches and um, parishes have been closing over the last um, two, three decades. And, uh, you know, I tend to St. Malachi and St. Malachi and St. Agatha are among the only, um, you know, uh, parishes and Catholic churches that are left on the West Side of Chicago. So. Yes, then I got to definitely continue to make a difference in the North Long Hill community. Let's see if we got Father back in and can add him in. Let's see. Father? Yes. Oh, amazing. We can hear you now. Can you hear me? Right. Uh-oh. Let's see. We may... Uh, hold on. Let's see. I, he may be talking to Juan Nona or one of the people that's helping him on that. Uh, let's see. Let me see. Uh Let's father. still get in or whatever. So can you hear me? Okay. All right. So Donald, let's continue on. Um, what else are some of the programs that you see coming to the future of helping those that are disadvantaged? Because well, first, first of all, we had a set of things that were already helping those that are disadvantaged, but now we have a new realm of people who are being, you know, who are disadvantaged now. Absolutely. And, and, you know, partners like St. Africa, uh, what they have been able to do, I mean, we have been able to make over 100,000, I must emphasize, over 100,000 phone banking calls to different households on the west side of Chicago and on the south side of Chicago. And it's really significant, you know, when we we're able to reach that many households with the telephone folks. In fact, you know, St. Africa and many of our partners, they're demonstrating once again that, you know, we can be good neighbors, good partners, and Folk that can help uplift the community. So this is very, very significant. Another thing that we've been doing, of course, is using a lot of um, virtual outlets, um, such as your show and others. But you know, again, with you know the type of uh, innovation that St. Agatha has come up with, getting their youth involved in media um, development. 
and media relations is really, really significant and has been quite innovative to get the youth involved at that level with various publications and, of course, on video and film. Mm -hmm. Very good. Well, I want to remind everybody before we continue on and then we'll see if we can get Father back. And if not, we have our good friend, uh, Deborah Wesley uh, Freeman, joining us in just a little bit. And you know, one thing I'm going to say, Donald, about uh, Deborah, she's been doing this as long as you have. You you both have truly been pioneers in this business. Yeah, we're a preschool together. <laughs> oh, you went to pre okay, good, good. I you right. You know, you know, we can't age women now. You know right. what I'm saying? So I'm glad you said it because I was just gonna say, well, she's been doing it since the embryo. So that's <laughs> that's what I was gonna go that direction. But okay, very good. All right. Well, Donald, I want to do a couple of things for the show and then we'll continue in just a second. Uh, are you having a good time as the co-host tonight? I'm having a blast. I got to come back. <laughs> OK, definitely. For sure. want to remind everyone that coming up on Monday, Monday, June 1st. Can you believe it's June 1st already? I am starting a new series on YouTube live every day. Uh, Monday through Friday from 12 noon to 1230, I'll be presenting Soul Food, What Feeds Your Soul. June is National Soul Food Month, believe it or not. I know a lot of you guys did not know that, but it is the official month of soul food. And so my new series, I'll sit down to talk one-on-one -on -one with some of the most fascinating people ever over virtual lunch. And the concept behind soul food is that you will tell me what was your favorite meal as a child or what is your favorite comfort food meal now, how you were exposed to that meal, and then we'll talk about your life from just that meal. What a lot of people don't realize is food is comforting. Uh, food allows people to open up and talk about themselves more in a compelling way. And it also allows them to reflect on their childhood and upbringing. So coming up Monday on Instagram, uh, Chat Daddy one on Instagram, please follow me. My first guest is uh, none other than legendary broadcaster, community activist, and humanitarian Bonnie Deshawn. Uh, as you guys all know, hey baby, Donald Oh, you know hey baby don't oh, you yes, yes, <laughs> we love hey baby don't we without a doubt that's our sister yes she is the host of bonnie's eye on 95.1 fm uh stepping chicago and so bonnie and i will talk about uh you know what feeds her soul and, and what soul food. And here's the deal. A lot of people think, Donald, that soul food is a black thing, but it's not a black thing. It you No matter where you're from in the world, there's some food that has fed your soul. Wouldn't you agree? What would you consider oh, your soul food, Donald? This conversation tonight. Oh, man, I appreciate that. I, oh, I, do. <laughs> I do, brother. I really look. I didn't know that. Right. Well, I'm, look, I'm just keeping it real. You know, well, I, there's this kind of conversation that helps to sustain the soul. So if you're not nourished tonight, I can't imagine how I am going to be nourished. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. Well, guess who's back and we going to work it out. And this is what I've been telling everybody about this technology. Anytime world news shows are having glitches and problems, only imagine what we have and with just standard Wi-Fi in our homes and offices. So let's welcome back to the show. Uh, Father Larry Dowling of uh, St. Agatha's Church on, a, in North Lawndale here in Chicago. Uh, yeah, Father, are you there? Just standard Wi Fi. Oh, okay. okay. he, we'll give him a minute. Welcome back to the show. Uh, <laughs> Father Larry Dowling of uh, St. Agatha's Church on, a, in North Lawndale here in Chicago. Uh, Father, are you there? I am Thank here. Thanks, Wi -Fi. Chad Daddy. Good. Thank you for your patience. Welcome back to the show. It's good to be with you. Okay, keep talking. So, so we've been doing uh, in the, in the midst of all of this, we've been doing a lot of outreach uh, in, to uh, our neighbors, uh, delivering probably close to fifty to seventy-five food baskets a week uh, to individuals. Um, doing a lot of outreach in regard to um, families in the community, just in making sure our outreach workers are working or are connecting with families in the community uh, through our parent-to-parent -parent outreach and uh, just continuing to uh, check in on people to make sure that they're doing okay, uh, check in on especially on our seniors in the community and uh, just continuing to, uh, to look at ways to uh, minister from a distance, if you will. 
Uh, but to be as present as we can to let people know that that we care. Okay, very good. Uh, what do you think, Father, will be some of the change of the uh, fellowship and worship with each other due to COVID-19? Okay, very good. Uh, what do you think, Father, will be some of the change of the Fellowship and worship with each other. So we've been managing to do uh, online um, videos of our services on Sunday and uh, continue to do that. We'll probably continue to do that for a while, uh, mainly because some people will be hesitant to come to church when we're allowed to start having church uh, formal services, which is probably still a few weeks away. Uh, but in the meantime, we uh, we continue to uh, uh, network with people. We have a men's uh, faith sharing group that we have on Wednesday evenings, uh, women's faith sharing that we do on Wednesday mornings, uh, all by uh, Zoom. And then uh, we're continuing a, a number of the different other programs that we have. We, we, have, we do conversations on race every second Tuesday of the month in the evening. And we have 40 to 50 people that have participated in that for two years. Mm -hmm. uh, we've done those last two meetings on Zoom and have had, uh, again, 40 to 50 people uh, in uh, those Zoom conversations. Wonderful. Well, I'm glad to hear that and that you are doing what's necessary uh, to keep the people of the community uh, engrossed in information and support and love. I think that's incredible. Uh, Father... I want to talk a little bit about what do you want to do next to embrace more people in the community? information. And then we're going to talk a little bit about the police brutality. So the main thing that we're trying to do right now is to um, is connect with people. Um, you know, mental health, uh, Chad Daddy, is a, a huge issue in our community and, uh, and trauma. And so we are trying to uh, make sure people are aware of the mental health services in the community through uh, uh, the Encompassing Center, uh, the new center that we set up uh, in the last uh, last year uh, in the community, uh, and then through the other mental health services in the community through St. Anthony Hospital, through I Am Able, uh, and others. So uh, our main concern is where people are mentally, and that includes um, includes our police officers. Mm -hmm. And so just trying to figure out ways to uh, just to help people be aware that there is, uh, there are resources to for people to talk to, and uh, to and connect with along the way. Okay, very good. Uh, I want before we close out your segment, Father, I want to get your take on the murder of George Floyd in Minneapolis. Uh, I know you know Donald and I both were saying how hard this is to see a million black man life snuffed out like that and you being a man of the cloth and you being a leader i know you feel some type of way about what has happened with the murder of George Floyd. yes uh, very much so very much so the um you know, just very deeply, deeply saddened by just a, another incident, uh, among many incidents, unfortunately, with the uh, with the police. And so, you know, I was walking through Douglas Park. I, I, I take a walk every day now through Douglas Park. And as I was walking through uh, the other day, I was just noticing some of the young men uh, in the community and just thinking that that everyone uh, has to feel at all times. And this isn't just because of this latest incident, just but on edge uh, because they don't know what an encounter with the police uh, could end up uh, being like. And so we are trying to figure out ways to um, uh, obviously build better relationships with the police. But at the same time, police accountability is a, is a huge issue. And so uh, we've been working as part of the coalition uh, with our work with the Community and Real Society for a ordinance for police accountability um, that would be uh, citizen oversight. And unfortunately, that's been um, uh, held up in the city council for some reason. Uh, we're uh, 
Not sure what that's all about, but at any time, uh, now is the time that we need that citizen oversight and police accountability. And so we are continuing to work on that, uh, trying to press the mayor. Uh, so uh, if I can give some encouragement to our viewers to uh, reach out to the mayor and say, uh, please have the city council pass GAPA. That's called GAPA, G-A-P-A. Uh, and it's an ordinance that would establish a, a citizen commission to oversee the Chicago Police Department. Okay, very good. Well, Father, how can we continue to follow, find you, and support your mission and effort uh, via the web and social media? So, so we are we are on uh, Facebook. Uh, we also. Well, Father, how can we continue to follow, find you, and support your mission and effort right. uh, via the web and social media? So we are on Facebook, and we are also on uh, uh, the web, so www.st-agatha-chicago.com. And uh, so I want to encourage that. I also want to want to uh, make a plug, if I can, Chad Daddy, for sure. Go right ahead. Uh, we are about to release our first gospel CD, uh, St. Agatha Gospel Choir. And uh, it is called "It's Over, It's All Right," and uh, they are go there are gospel songs that have been uh, uh, written by most of them have been written by our music director Dennis Smith, and uh, we are excited. The release should be uh, in the next couple of weeks, and we hope people will uh, tap into that and uh, take advantage of that. Uh, we've also produced a couple of videos from the community. One of our parishioners, uh, Deontay Wilson has produced a couple of videos on about the West Side, and uh, they've been based out of St. Agatha. He's been producing from here, and so um, uh, people can uh, connect with those through uh, the uh, what's called Code Switchers, the Code Switchers website, uh, and uh, it's Deontay Wilson. So just to encourage that, of course, what people love, uh, the, the proceeds from our CD sales will be to help our ministry here at the parish and our outreach. So again, hopefully people will tap into that. Well, now, Father, I'm going to do one better. I'm going to have you back on the show and maybe we can get a performance out of some of these performances. And that way I can help with sales and quality sound and everything. That's the type of person I am. How is that? That would be great. We greatly appreciate that. Thank you. My pleasure. Absolutely. We'll make it happen. Ladies and gentlemen, Father Larry Dowling of uh, St. Agatha in North Lawndale. Let's give him a big round of applause. He's an amazing guy. God bless you, Father, and thank you for all you do. God bless you as well, Chad Daddy. Keep up the great work. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Have a great night. All right, Donald Dew, we did that. We did the dog on fact. You there? Yeah, I'm here. Yeah, are you, you, you hanging in? You doing the right thing? Absolutely, doing fine. I know this is amazing. This is a great show so far. Let me remind everyone that tonight's show is a very special show. I'm normally on uh, Monday through Thursday night from 7 to 8 30 p.m. Tonight is all about unity. Tonight is all about talking to you guys about the importance of filling out your 2020 census. Uh, it's also a conversation to inspire each and every one of you to have hope, even though we're in the midst of a global pandemic. This is something that many of us have never experienced before. Uh, we have we had no idea that our lives would change the way they've changed. And so tonight I have just a one wonderful group of people who are able to encourage, inspire, motivate uh, people who speak on the principle of love all the time. Our first guest tonight was the Lieutenant Governor of the state of Illinois, Juliana Stratton, who did an extraordinary job of just talking about who she is as a person, her position as the Lieutenant Governor, and all of the outreach that she's doing to try to help people. And then my co-host tonight is the wonderful Mr. Donald J. Dew, who's been in outreach since he's been in preschool. Now, we just going to put it like that. He is, since preschool, he's been doing this. Uh, 36 years, Donald. Uh, so I take it you you know the ins and outs of everything after 36 years. Brother, we got to get you a gold watch for all of that time on, on the job. 36 years. Wow. You know, it's, it's been a labor of love. And, um, you know, uh, again, I just want to emphasize that um, part of what we can embrace in terms of uh, this real love principle 
is the love of service. And yes. you no, know, that's servant leadership. That's a godly love. That's a relationship that feeds the soul in, in a way that uh, keeps you lifted, keeps you motivated. It's the kind of thing that makes you understand and embrace fully that fear and faith cannot coexist, that we must always have faith over fear. And that mm -hmm. if we'd given in and given up during the time of the Middle Passage, we wouldn't be here. If right. we up during the time we were on the plantation with all the lynchings going on, we wouldn't be here. Right. So we're trying to, with the census count, Chat Daddy, make sure that tomorrow is possible for the next generation. And that's mm -hmm. how important their civic duty is. Be involved in the district. Now, Donald, has there been a struggle trying to get people to really complete the census? I know there's a lot of outreach. I know, you know, people have been on the ground. I've been seeing the material. I've been seeing people reminding people. That's what we all of us good stewards have been encouraging people yes. to do the right thing. But has it been a really tough effort on behalf of trying to collect this data from people? You know, in some census tracts, yes, it has, because similar to voter apathy, we've had some census apathy. Um, that's why we've been really, really trying to emphasize the message that you do count on the way that we really get in the door, so to speak, is to make sure that people know that we do care. Um, mm -hmm. And they get a real sense of that because you're providing them with something that's taking care of a very real need. Basically, mm -hmm. in some cases, as you've seen with many of our churches, people are being given food. You know, they're giving yeah. you know, the, the safety masks, they're giving gloves, and they're giving things that are helping to sustain their lives. It's, very difficult for, for you to feel that you don't count when people are showing that level of care and consideration. Mm -hmm. Very good. Well, Donald, our last and final guest this evening, we saved the most amazing for last. You notice you and I, we started off with fabulous and yeah. you and I will end with fabulous tonight. It's almost like it's a fabulous sandwich and you and I are stuck in the middle. Is that okay? Yeah, it's all right with me. <laughs> it's all right with me, right. It's a Friday night fabulous sandwich. Absolutely. And our last guest, uh, I'm noticing she's in the broadcast waiting room now. Donald, you said that you and this lady have been doing this since preschool. She, I, I'm telling you, she never ages. She never ages. She, she's always beautiful, fabulous. And what's so interesting, she's a boss. And that's and she's been a boss. And that's what I love about her. Ladies and gentlemen, our next guest tonight is the amazing Deborah Wesley Freeman. Uh, she is the president of Sinai Community Institute. Uh, not only do I love and adore her, but again, as I said, she's a boss. How are you? Good evening, Deborah. Welcome to the show. Hey, good evening. I I I, I need to jack you two up, okay? <laughs> Go ahead, jack it up. I heard what you said. <laughs> you said I was old as dust. <laughs> see, see? And Donald, didn't I say it? I said, Donald, you gonna say y'all went to preschool. I, I know well, these women, they don't play that. See, right. <laughs> I thought I had my two favorite bros on both sides. <laughs> you do, you do. Look, Deborah, I said that you've been doing this since you were an embryo. So, so you see what I'm saying? And see, you're only 20 years old. See, you're only hey, 20. Okay, God bless you. Bless you. <laughs> see, I know what to do, Donald. But you know what? One of the things I said. I love my age. I love this, you know, in terms of the space and the body and just everything that, that the here and now. I hate what's going on, but I'm not going to deny the fact of the trip, the journey that God has, has taken me through to get me here today to talk to you two. Yes. Well, we love you. We do. Deborah, what I want to talk to you about more than anything is let's talk about your position, who you are. You've been doing what you've been doing for a long time and how your ministry really has made a major impact on so many people. So the floor is all yours. Well, I always start with, you know, I'm a preacher's kid. OK, so I grew up sitting on the front pew with the deacons. OK. That was, you know, so I started on the west side at Nine Hill Missionary Baptist Church, right across from, uh, it used to be right across from where Costco's is. And I actually was born at Mount Sinai Hospital. And I uh, lived right across the street off of Holman during my early years. So I'm, I'm a west sider. Um, and I joined Sinai uh, about 33 years ago. And my background is social work. And, but I, I always start with, I'm a minister's child. So this is, I'm not in front of the pulpit like my brothers are, but I am in the community doing 
three. So what I have to do is to figure out how can I, um, while and when you when you see people who come to the hospital, you see the cut, you see a cut, but I feel the cut, and mm. I I want to understand what's really really going. on. Uh, in your life that we can talk about and we can, uh, I want it to be up close and personal. So from day one, that's been my journey to figure out how do I, um, when, when a patient comes in, how do I sh share with them that I see you mm -hmm. and I understand you and I want to understand the dynamics. I don't know about you, but it is totally, it is all totally unacceptable to me to have an 11 or 12 year old walk into a hospital to deliver a baby. That's right. That's that, right. That, that in itself, it's like, so I'm looking at, okay, we're going to make sure the baby is delivered in a healthy way, that the young lady uh, is, is going to be okay. But I'm worrying about the future of that, that young mother, the future of that baby, you know, where's the father in the picture, all of those things, because I was blessed to have parents that welcomed me in the world and uh, wanted me and has treated me along with my brothers. I'm an only girl, okay? Um, but treated us as if they wanted us and we were just embraced in love, day one. And our children need to feel that and know that. And, and to some extent, there's a lot of, of that missing. And, and I think it's on us to help them find it and figure out how to get it and how to love oneself Therefore, you can love others because you can't love other people if you don't love yourself. Mm -hmm. so, um, I've been at Sinai, um, like I said, 33 years. And my goal was to be more community facing. My background is social work. So while I want to uh, obviously make sure that their experience in a hospital is, is a great experience, I also want to know what's going to happen when you discharge. You know, how are you prepared to deal with whatever? If you're a diabetic, I always used to say to the residents and to the doctors, okay, don't just drive to Sinai. Look around. When you're making a discharge plan and you say they need you need to eat better, I need to say, well, where are? Tell me what what grocery store did you see in our community that they mm -hmm. can get, you know? So it's like paying attention, putting your eyes out and looking and seeing what's all around you and put it in context of a people that's always struggling unnecessarily because we've been living in a community that uh, was burnt down and I'm praying that it doesn't get that way with what's going on. But there's been all this disinvestment in our community. We're like, what, 15 minutes away from the loop. That's right. That's right. Drive right there. But why can't, why do I have to, when I'm at Sinai, I say, I want to go to a nice restaurant that serves healthy food because I want to make sure I don't have high blood pressure. I want, I make sure I'm taking care of myself. But if I can't find a place, I don't, I can't eat fries and, and hamburgers all the time. I have to eat mm -hmm. my way if we're going to be healthy. I mean, the reality is when we talk, even like with this COVID right now, there are pre existing conditions that are creating. Uh, kind of the, the 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 conditions where uh black folks and brown folks but black folks in particular are not surviving because they're walking in wounded walking in with serious issues such as diabetes and hypertension cardiovascular disease and then you layer that with with this invisible uh virus it just makes it untenable i was just looking at the data today in the state of Illinois, the mortality rate is 4.5%. In Chicago, it's 4.7%, the mortality rate in terms of folks who, who don't make it. My goodness. Guess what it's in at Sinai? What is 17.4%. Oh my God. So, so we're looking That's at numbers of epic proportion. Absolutely. And you, ha I have to say, why? You know, I, I've tried to exist at Sinai, and 27 years ago, thank God, the board has been amazing, has allowed me to just kind of think outside the box. That's one of the reasons why we created Sinai Community Institute, because 
in a hospital setting, you 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 could become in a box because you're thinking about the medical conditions. Well, I'm thinking because I know Donald is is uh, is a social. Worker. I'm thinking about the psychosocial environmental issues that are contributing to the health conditions. And let's get up close and personal with our community and figure. I agree. Out we work together. My question to both of you all, because you really are veterans in this, you you are who we would go to as our thought leaders on just trying to heal and help our people. We've been talking about healing and helping our people for years now. And, and do you ever think that one day, you know, the healing will actually begin. I think we band-aid a lot of things in our community with our people and not really heal them, you, you know? And so do you think that healing will ever begin? And if you don't mind, Deborah, I want to start with Donald first to get his answer on will the healing ever begin? Donald, what do you think? Well, first of all, let me just uh, salute uh, my sister, Deborah Wesley, and her ministry and her service to our community. She is truly a servant leader, and that is the only reason why I say we went to peace with together, because we've been doing this a long time. And your <laughs> commitment and your passion is unparalleled. So I thank you so much for all your good work in our community. And yeah. you know, um, Deborah also mentioned the, the infant mortality rate. Let me just say this, um, and, and Deborah, you remember when we were dealing with the 9 by 9 initiative. Absolutely. And so the goal back in those days was to get the double digit infant mortality rate reduced to nine infant deaths per thousand uh, by the year 1990. Well, guess what? To your point, Chad Daddy, there was healing that occurred. We did impact that infant mortality rate and we did get it down into single digits. So the question mm -hmm. is, what happened? Why is it that you know the, the numbers are ticking back up again and getting into double digits? Well, you know, systemically speaking, we've got to make sure that the healing is more complete and whole. Um, that was one of the folks that really was doing integrated healthcare before it was fashionable to call it integrated healthcare. Looking at you know both mind and body, looking at the integration and the relationship between the two, and realizing that you couldn't treat one without the other. You know, so in other in order for real and true healing to occur, you got to be able to treat the person holistically, and you got to create those systemic changes that can deal with the social determinants of health. Environment mm -hmm. speaking, those conditions that in fact exacerbate high infant mortality rates, you know, um, mortality rates, period. Uh, you know, when you think about a 20 year difference between life expectancy on the west side of Chicago versus downtown or more, you know, it's all about, you know, the environment. It's about the trauma, it's about the violence, it's about all those social indicators, lack of good, uh, appropriate housing, poor nutrition, all of these issues contribute to the lack of healing as a real option in our community. So mm -hmm. ultimately, and I mean this very, very sincerely, We've got to go back to some of the basics. You know, way back when, before my time, Daddy, and, and Deborah's time, uh, you know, it was like home economics being taught in school. Right? That's right. Okay. Right. So why not do what they're doing in Baltimore right now and, you know, instead of um, sending our kids to detention, teach them mindfulness principles, how to meditate, how to do yoga, tai chi, you know, understand how to control impulses, you know, that are born by the violent experience and environment that they're exposed to. You know, why not give them the skills and the tools to handle, you know, and in fact, engage in mind over matter, consciousness over emotion. And in fact, let me also quickly say this, half of what we go through is not understanding that half the battle is about what goes in the mouth and what comes out. Oh. What goes in the mouth and what comes out. So yes, sir. We start teaching our children how to eat better nutritionally, and we make sure that more nutritious foods are available to them. That's half the battle. And then yeah. we make sure that you know we curb the tongue, curb what is said, curb how things are said, and be more loving in our communication with each other. Again, the theme is love, so I'm still on that love thing. We got to make sure that we demonstrate that we're examples of how to be more loving towards each other and speak in more loving ways. Yes, absolutely. I cannot agree with you more. Uh, before I get Deborah's statement, I want to remind everybody that this is a very special Friday night edition of the Real Chat Daddy Show. Uh, tonight's show is dedicated to love, love of mankind, love of our city, our community, our state. Uh, tonight, I've welcomed some amazing guests tonight just to talk about how can we love each other. Right now, we're living in the midst of a global pandemic. This is something we've never heard of, a global pandemic. 
who knew? And keep in mind that a lot of our black and brown communities had already been suffering. A lot of issues that had been going on uh, in our community for years, these issues are now more magnified. And as Deborah said so eloquently earlier, we're talking about now something that we can't even see. We, we so worried that if somebody sneezes or cough right now, oh Lord, you got the COVID. I told somebody for people with allergies, this is a horrible time for people with allergies because you know you can't even sneeze or cough without people looking crazy. So now, you know, Deborah, I do want to find out from you because you've been saying a lot of knowledgeable things this evening, as you always do. What you know, what what are we to expect next from all of this? And where can we go? The same question I gave Donald. Well, you know what, I, and I may be off base, but I think we have to look inside of ourselves and inside of our own community. We have our own answers, okay? We've got to stop looking for others to solve our own problems, our own kind of issues that, that, that's going on. Um, and working together, we've got to figure out how do we bring that love love, and, and, and support within, within each other. When I was raised on... Um, in North Lawndale, we knew every, I had a parent every day, every dog on where. Yes. You know, we knew how to behave. We knew what was acceptable. We knew that when the light came on, right? Where were you supposed to be at nighttime? In the, in house. the house, in the house, in the house. You know, we have to kind of take a step back and say, think about we're, we're standing on the shoulders of people who fought for us to be here today. Mm -hmm. And we forget, we're not gonna be here if we don't kind of take a look. What did it take for our grandparents and great grandparents to, to go through the horrible conditions like this um, that are much more um, struggle, they had much more struggles, many more struggles than we can even imagine. Right. We, we can do this, but you know what? We can't do it if we're invisible and if we're not counted. That's why this whole census is so important. When we talk about the infant mortality rates, how we worked hard to get those rates down. And what they do is they take the money and move it somewhere else. Well, the thing is, is if we're not counted, they don't even know we're there. That's right. And this is a way, because this actually, and, and Donald, you might correct me. I don't remember any time during uh, the census time when it's been so much outreach mm -hmm. in your face personal talking to folks and saying this is really important and connecting the dots yeah. and I, I i'm an optimist i'm and i have faith that folks understand that if we want to change what's going on right now we're gonna have to take we're gonna have to make some change yes in right behavior and what we do and how we participate in government the fact if we don't get our hands out and vote in november and we end up with more of what we've got right now. Shame on you. Woo, what you shame say? On you. Shame on you. That's right. I agree. Yep, I agree with you 100. percent Shame yeah. on you. Go right ahead, Donald. You want to rebuttal to what she's saying? I, I, I just got to agree 100 percent with what uh, Deborah is saying. I have never seen this level of intense outreach in our community that's going on for this 2020 census, and it's because of this type of commitment that you see uh, as expressed by Deborah right now, and the continued compassion and commitment to our community. It's those three C's, you know, commitment, compassion, and community. And as you constantly see manifested in all of the partners that are part of this coalition. Um, that's what's making a difference right now. We're serious about it. You know, we're not playing games. It's not about the dollar because, you know, dollars don't excite us like that. It's about really trying to create the legacy effect. You know, that Sankofa effect. Looking at, you know, what was going on yesterday and trying to make tomorrow possible. Absolutely. Right. Yes, absolutely. I couldn't agree with you more. Deborah, I want to come back to you real quick and get your take on the George uh, Floyd murder that happened this week. Uh, we've talked to all of our guests tonight about the impact of that. Uh, time and time again, we've witnessed another death of an African-American at the hands of uh, our what we consider our authorities, our law enforcement authorities. And, and here we are, another tragic situation, and now we have looting and rioting going on and protesting. What are your thoughts on all of that? Well, you know, I was, uh, let me just say, I'm a mother of a son, of a black son. And, and I've tried to explain to my colleagues 
that life for us as a black mom is so different from yours. Yes. My son calls me. I'm not, I automatically, my blood pressure goes up because I want to know, are you okay? Is everything okay? It can't just be something normal like mom, hey, uh, can you loan me $10? That kind of stuff. It's mm -hmm. about the fear of our, of, our, of our children. I am very fearful that if we don't stop this, this is, um, this started from the top. I mean, th this we're seeing the hearts and the souls of people who just don't like us because we were kissed by the sun. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? But they want to go and get, get kissed somewhere else. But kind mm -hmm. of, my thing is that we have to stand up. We cannot be silent. We, do we need to be violent and tear up our neighborhoods? Hell no. But we must have our voices heard that enough is enough. Enough is enough. So mm -hmm. you know, we have to use our political power, uh, mobilize, and and just like I'm so glad that they're going to charge these folks for what they what they did and kill this man. That's a right. piece that's gone. And he, and uh, George, he just represents one more, one more, and one more black man and black woman who's lost their future and their potential. Think, and think about the children. I don't know if he had children. I don't know all the details on that, but they have lost that connection. And so I am saddened. I am fearful, but I am optimistic. that I think we're going to be woke now. Yes. Yes. I couldn't agree with you more. I could not agree with you more. You're absolutely right about that. Before I uh, close out tonight's show and, and allow you both to make final statements and Donald, I want you to thank all of our wonderful people who've helped us to put this show together tonight. I want to let everybody know coming up on the Monday night edition of the Real Chat Daddy Show, 7 p.m. Monday night, uh, welcome to the show, the former mayor of Gary, Indiana, uh, Karen Freeman Wilson. She is now the new president of the Chicago Urban League. And uh, she and I will be having a conversation about uh, the current state of everything that is going on, uh, not only here in Chicago, Illinois, but across the country. And uh, we'll also talk about some of the amazing things that the Chicago Urban League is doing uh, to try to uh, to try to do outreach within the city of Chicago to help as many of our people who are in need right now because everybody's in need. They really are. Uh, Deborah, I'd like for you to give your closing thought as well as how we can find you, follow and support you and all of your efforts that you're doing. And then Brother Donald and I will continue to close on out as well too. Deborah, it's been amazing having you on here tonight. And again, ageless, ageless beauty. That's all I'm gonna say. And you keep doing hey, great work. There, my dear. I, you know, I love you guys. Thank you so much. What, you know, because I am so worried about the number of our people, black and brown people who are dying unnecessarily. Uh, Sinai just opened up a, a website on Sinai.org that is a Sinai Health System COVID self-assessment tool. And what that'll do is answer the questions, do you need to get tested? And if you do, here's how you do it. Kind of thing. We need to get folks in and get tested. If you don't know, all you're doing is spreading this to another loved one. So I'm, I'm going. I want to say that the other closing remark is, and I know that Winona is going to share with you. Uh, we're going to unveil a new uh, record, a CD, and a video that Kim Stratton uh, crafted for us, and it's called "Sound the Alarm," and it is around the COVID. Uh, and we have a video around that because we have to get the message out. We have to, we cannot keep this pandemic going. We can stop this. So I want to uh, pray for everyone who, who's out there listening to me uh, and, and the great words that, that Chad Daddy and Donald have. I want to pray for us and for you that we're going to get through this together. Thank you. Yes. Very good. Hey, you know, Deborah, I see another Friday night entertainment show between uh, the great father of Dowling and now you got something going on. We need oh, to have, yeah. you know, look, we need to have a good old Friday night party on this air and, and make it happen. We gonna have to bring it on out there. You know, that's right. Put, put a message out there so we can get folks to, to hear what they need to hear. 
Very good. Well, Deborah, thank you so very much for taking time out of your schedule. We really appreciate you. I'm praying for your son to be healthy, strong, and continue to be a positive black man in today's society. And for you being a great mom. I love him and my two daughters because they'll hang me. That's right. That's right. Give, give all the family some love. Yes. yes. But thank, thank you, you so much for thank being you, with us tonight. My pleasure. Donald, do you want to say anything to her before we let her go? Oh, absolutely. I just want to thank you once again, uh, my sister, Deborah Wesley, for all your wonderful, compassionate work in our community. It really, really is has been a joy and continues to be a joy to have you as a um, co-partner in this Servant Leadership Commission. Uh, I look forward to many, many more years. Uh, you know, I don't know about you, but I've been moving to work retirement uh, from my vocabulary. Uh, so uh, you, you got to hang out in here with your brother. We got to keep on doing what we're doing out here. Uh, look, you first. <laughs> look, I'm telling both of y'all now. You can't retire. What? What are you talking about? You well, can't we got retire. Some new definition on retirement. What that? Looks like. Right, right. <laughs> just, just say you're reducing your hours. That's how you say that. You're reducing your hours. That's all. But no, neither one of y'all. Uh, uh. No, we ain't having that. No, look, I'm gonna personally come and say what? what retiring? No, you're reducing your hours. You're working from home now. That's okay. what you call it. That's right. That's right. I'm in well, my she shed. You see my she shed? <laughs> your she shed is fabulous. Look, if you have something in your she shed, make sure I'm one of the 10 people that can come over. <laughs> That's the plan. <laughs> All right. I love you. I do. Deborah, take care of yourself and God bless. Thanks so much. Thank you. All right. Have a beautiful night. Boy, that was good, Donald Do. Well, we done did the doggone thing, huh? Hey, it's been fabulous. You know, again, Chad Daddy, thank you so much for this opportunity. You did a fabulous job. Always do. But thank, thank you so much for the night. Really appreciate it. Yeah. Well, now, Donald, let's shout out everybody who needs some shout out at this point. Who who all do we need to give yeah. some good old shout out to? Well, all of our 30 members of the Counting on Chicago Coalition uh, 2020. Um, again, they continue to do a fabulous job. And you heard uh, Deborah said in her comments that she has never witnessed this level of intensive outreach and community engagement that is going on right now. This coalition is serious. We want the city of Chicago, the state of Illinois, and the United States of America to know that they can count on our coalition to make sure that there's a fair count within these communities of color. It's gotta happen right now. I also just wanna thank um, our other guests tonight. Of course, Lieutenant Governor uh, Juliana Stratton uh, for her compassion and commitment to our community and making sure that she's always there. You know, there's never a call that she does not answer. Whenever we've asked her to be a part of any particular form, she's been there representing and doing an exceptional job uh, leading our state government as well. And of course, uh, Father Larry Dowling um, of St. Act of the Third Church, you know, so, so much more to come from them. As you've already mentioned, we're going to be back on the show with the kids and uplifting the, the videos that they've done and the productions there. So it's going to be a very positive show in that regard as well. But, you know, we've got, again, you know, 27 more partners that you can have rotated on your show so we can take up the next three, four months. You know, that kind of look, look, brother, I want to keep doing this. Look, we can make it happen because our people need to be informed. Our people need to be uh, the best at everything that we do. And now more than ever, I want to see that love, happiness, and energy happen for all mankind. I really do. But especially people that look like you and I. Absolutely. And if I may close with a bit of a poem, because, you know, I'm one of the most two brothers and I listened to a lot of the Motown sound back in the day. Go right ahead. But, you know, of course, with everything that's happening in Minnesota and what's been happening within our communities, and not just here in Chicago, but all the violence, we really do need peace and we do need to continue to embrace love and unity within our community. So the four tops years ago, they made a song called Still Waters Peace and Still Waters Love. And in that Still Waters Peace version, they simply said, P is for the privilege of loving and the privilege of being loved. E is for the ease it gives the soul and the mind. A is for the absence in your search to find yourself. C is to calm your fears if you like what you find. And E, E is everlasting, and his love never cease. Peace. Amen. Look, brother, what time you logging in on Sunday? Look, 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 look. We doing we doing virtual church now. Look, what time we logging in? Look, if you quote a little Barry White and, and a little Teddy Pendergrass before church is over, and then put some BB Winans in there, brother, it, look, you got a whole sermon right there. Barry White, nothing could ever change my dear the way I feel about you. <laughs> <laughs> 
That is why I'm saying my love. We so deep, so true. <laughs> That's what I'm talking about. Well, Donald, it has been just amazing having you as the co-host this yes, evening. Uh, I've enjoyed every moment of this. Any way that I can continue to help and be a part of this, I am just so excited to do what I can. Uh, we're getting so much feedback from our audience tonight. Everybody's just thinking this has been an excellent show. And, uh, you know, it really has been. It's been good. And I thank you. I thank Deborah, And, of course, I thank our Lieutenant Governor, Juliana Stratton, for all that she does each and every day and being such a wonderful leader that we just appreciate. Thank you so much, Ted. This has been fabulous. Looking forward to the next opportunity. All right, sir. I'm looking forward to it as well. Have a great night, my friend, and we'll be in touch very soon. Uh, big you. round of applause for the amazing Mr. Donald J. Do. He got that beard going on in that baseball cap. Y'all wouldn't know him. Look, he's a sharp brother, but now he got his holiday beard going on. Thank you, brother. God bless and have a great night. Thank you. Appreciate you, bro. Take care. Thank you. Sir. All right. Wonderful. All right, you guys. Well, we've come to the end of another show. It's so funny. It's 8 4 3 p.m. And uh, you guys have been pushing me to uh, go on to 9 o'clock every night. Like, who knows? We'll see. Uh, don't forget tomorrow night, Saturday at 9.45 p.m. I'll be joining at and comedian Erica Watson on her a wildly popular uh, Facebook and YouTube show, Nightcap with Erica Watson. Uh, tomorrow night, we'll be talking about uh, sex and how powerful it is. And sex uh, is, is big business. Uh, believe it or not, everything from prostitution to uh, just even when you meet somebody, are you really interested? in them or is it about their money? So I'm looking forward to talking to Erica and the other panelists tomorrow night about how sex sells. And then don't forget on Monday, I'll kick off my new YouTube, uh, yeah, no, Instagram, Instagram series. I got to get used to all of this. I'll be on Instagram live Monday at 12 noon. Uh, it's entitled Soul Food, What Feeds Your Soul. I'll sit down for one-on-one interviews with people about who they are, where they come from, what food inspired them over the years, their comfort foods, things like that. Uh, my first guest Monday is a legendary radio personality, community activist, and humanitarian, the one and only Miss Bonnie Deshawn. And then on Tuesday, I have another great, I have a musician Tuesday that will be joining me. You'll love it. Uh, all next week will be great shows. Don't forget Monday night on The Real Chat Daddy Show at 7 p.m., uh, the former mayor of Gary, Indiana, now who is the current president of the Chicago Urban League, uh, Karen Freeman uh, Wilson. Will, Karen Wilson Freeman will be joining me. I apologize for that. I'm looking forward to that as well as I'm going to have a very special guest co-host on Monday night as well, too. So it's going to be really good. So glad that you guys took time uh, to tune in tonight. Uh, I know you guys are pushing for me to do five nights a week. We'll see. We'll figure it out. Don't forget to Visit therealchatdaddy.com for more information about me, therealchatdaddy.com. Do me a favor, start a watch party. Share as much as you can about this show. Oh, this show is here to help people. It's all about the love of people, and that's what tonight has been about. Here's the deal. Congratulations to all of you all. Thank you to Counting on Chicago Coalition. I really do appreciate you guys so much for allowing me to do this beautiful show tonight. Uh, be safe this weekend. I no, uh, the governor has allowed Illinois to get out and kind of do a few more things. Don't forget that the city of Chicago is still under our shelter in place until Wednesday. Uh, continue to wash your hands, wear your mask, uh, continue to sanitize and do all the right things of loving your family and, and, and keeping the spread of COVID at bay. And just enjoy this beautiful weather. On behalf of myself, the green room, I thank you guys so much for joining me tonight. God bless you all and have a great weekend. I'm out. Goodbye. Chat Daddy. <laughs>